to We're uh, live. STS Live. <laughs> We've got James and uh, pro guide David Johnson here with us tonight, and it's going to be fun uh, running through some different techniques and uh, a little history, too. The stories. I'm excited for Yeah. <laughs> so Dave and I were just talking, you know, I haven't seen Dave in a while, about uh, when we first met. I mean, we've known each other for how many years, you figure now? Uh, Probably like 28, 29 years. Yeah, so it's been a while. Yeah. Uh, back in the day, I know we fished quite often. We fished a lot. Yeah, you know? I mean, I was just starting 90s. out to be a guide. And I didn't have very, you know, many clients and yeah. what have you. We were in our twenties and just yeah. fishing all the time. And what well, we've fished everywhere. We've been. We did. Yeah. We all fished together here, here and... Alaska, Canada. We fished yeah, it all. That's right. Yeah. Were you guiding back then? Yeah. In your early twenties. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I started in '93, so nice. this will be my thirtieth year. Wow. It seems like just yesterday you were the new guy, and now it's, like, <laughs> it's a lot of new guys. I remember back in yeah. the day. I was, being, I was really bored. <laughs> yeah, so James is going to start guiding here in about uh, three months or so. He's got a boat on the way. And, okay. What, what, and, what kind of boat are you getting? Uh, 25 foot Columbia. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Very nice. And I don't know if I said it, but James is Tony's son in law. Yeah, so I knew. Yeah, yeah, yeah Tony had yeah, told me that. Right. Yeah. Gotcha. So, um,. Yeah, so you run uh, Lumwell, right? Yeah, I have a 23 yeah. um, Columbia right now. Nice. Yeah, yeah. it's been a long process. Mm-hmm. It's been like almost two years when I put it in for the order. Right. And then that was like pr- almost like the tail end of COVID, and then mm-hmm. like they weren't sure if they are getting motors or, you know. But luckily, we're getting closer. We're counting down the days. I'm right excited for a new boat. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. You know? So, uh, a funny thing is, on that last show, we talked about where you caught your first steelhead. Tony and I kind of showed yeah. you what to do and mm-hmm. told on the you clock where, where to go. It's pretty close to where David caught one of his first steelhead. I'm not sure exactly where your very first one was, but I know it seems like you said down there kind of by High Rocks or something. Didn't you That's where I caught there? several caught of, of my first ones. Yeah, um, so he caught his first one like right yeah. below there. Mm-hmm. Kind of where the, the <laughs> trestle bridge was. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the old so, trestle. All through high school. Yeah. Um, that's That was my area I fished. Yeah, Put so. a lot of time in that spot. <laughs> yeah. Well, the first time I went, it was like, you know, we're at Christmas with Grandpa Frank and Gail. And mm-hmm. they're like, oh, yeah, just go down here. And I was like, okay, go down and, you know, sure stuff. <laughs> fish on. Yeah. It's good stuff. A lot yeah. of memories. So, so we're... Uh, Tony putting a couple of pictures up there. He had, oh, he had, right. A little bit ago, he yeah, had my first. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, the first weird. Chinook that I ever caught right there. Oh, this will be When fun. was that? Okay. Uh, wow. Yeah. What's the story uh, there? I think I was about 15. That was on the Trask. And it was, yeah, somebody, uh, a friend of one of my mom's friends took me down to the Trask one day and Bobber and eggs. Bobber and eggs. Right and eggs. On. Well, that's a big memory maker there. Yeah. <laughs> that's something you're excited. <laughs> and that. That one there is, uh, that's a 50-pounder. That was my biggest Jeez. Uh, for Oregon. You don't even see that anymore. No. Nothing resembled to that. And I was so jealous. Uh, that was, I was probably like 15 or 16 also. And I had a friend that had caught a 56-pounder when we were in junior high. <laughs> oh, and I was so, so always so jealous of him of catching a 56-pounder. You got six pounds on me. Yeah, well, it, you know, and like a couple of years later, I caught that one. So, right. no. That's right awesome. on. What do we got there? Uh, that's a one my dad caught back in about that same time frame. It was a 40 pounder. So, were the fish bigger, in your opinion, on average back then? Or on average, yes. Okay. Yeah. You know, I would say what the hens were probably in the 25 to 30, low 30s. Mm-hmm. Bucks were usually around 30 plus. Wow. You know, right. for the most part. I mean, wow. we catch smaller ones. Like, we saw that. Yeah. That one that was my first one, you know, it was only like 15 pounds or something like that. So there were small ones too, but you no. Know. If only. What's, what's this? That one I caught the day after I turned 16. Yeah, I turned 16, got my driver's license, and the next day me and a buddy drove up to the upper Clackamas and caught that summer steel. It was. Oh, the- <laughs> I missed that fishery yeah. up there. What were you using back then? I caught just on gob eggs. Gob eggs? Yeah. Yeah, that was... That was such a good fishery that they yeah. have ruined and taken away and Absolutely. probably the most successful hatchery program ever, you know? Yeah, that's kind I of mean, where I got serious about fishing. You know, Dad took me out when I was young, but that's where I would go once I turned 16. What do you think oh, That's my first springer there. 
Oh boy, that's a big, big deal there. Yeah, so where, first, where did you catch? What were that's you in Oregon with? City. Caught it back bouncing prawn up on the sandbar. Sandbar. Yep. Yeah. Back bouncing prawns in the sandbar. <laughs> <laughs> Seen a few videos of you doing that. Yeah. I I remember, like when Tony and I like first when I first got really hard into springer fishing, and I would always see you or Bob or you know you guys were kind of the main up above two hundred five, mm. and it was like. Well, they're catching fish. <laughs> yeah. they're, they're doing good. Tell me what's going on, you know? A few times myself. We need to go over go over next to Dave John Dave Johnson and go catch some fish. <laughs> or yeah. uh, borrow some eggs. Or yeah. borrow some <laughs> eggs. <laughs> Those were some off the sandy there back in the Christmas vacation yeah. time frame of high school. I'll tell you that one, that steel that I caught there, um, when I cleaned it, it had a bunch of sand trip heads in its belly. And where people had been pinching off the head, off the head. using a tail, yeah. and it had a bunch of heads. So ever since then, I always used the heads. <laughs> use the heads of it? Yeah. Wow. That's a cool little trick. Yeah. But never even think about that. Those were the days. Remember Gary Froggy? Yeah, is that Froggy right yeah. there? Is that Greg Frogger? No, yeah. no. Oh. This is Gary Froggy. Yeah, he used to work at G.I. Joe's. <laughs> that was an 18-pounder he caught on the Clackamas. That's going way back. Yeah. Yeah, that was, those were the drift fishing days, right? Yeah, pretty he, much. He caught that on a corkies uh, and what have you. Yep, I remember he caught that on a chrome spin glow with the red head and a little thing of eggs, and I caught that one on a pink pearl corky and eggs. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> so, yeah, those are my college buddies. We used to fish the sandy a lot when we went to Mount Hood for fisheries. Wow. So you yeah. asked what happened to the summer yeah. steel. Yeah, head. what do you what do you think changed? I mean, obviously hatcheries come in effect and you know what they do or nutrients in the river. Mm -hmm. Do you think like what what changed from back then to now? Well they release less fish. It's yeah, plain, they, plain they, and they simple. Moved, those are the hatchery summer steel that we're talking about. They just moved them down to mm -hmm. the yeah. river, basically. They probably but, also cut the Release yeah, yeah, quite a number, quite a bit, down. yeah, and, uh, and there just isn't as much quality bank fishing down in the lower river. There's and, some, but up, right. up there's through, not a mile. There's not there are yeah. more, miles and miles of places, and the water's warm down low too. Right, right, exactly. And yeah, then, you had an extended fishery. You could fish from all the way into November, and some of the fish still. Yeah, because when I even nice. first started, I noticed it was earlier. You know, like you could maybe get one Thanksgiving, and now that's like, you know, you're a rock star if you do that. Right. Yeah, and that that's a symptom. That's you're talking winter fish. Yeah, that's yeah. how they they switched over to the later brood yeah. stock and shifted that run and later. Then and then took away the early stock fish. And then taking it into the the summer steel it too. Mm -hmm. And that now, what's the word? I'm hearing fishing's been pretty good. A few of my buddies have got some pretty good numbers so far down on the coast, but mostly you know north coast. Yeah, um, I've only been out once. Um, I've I've got I've been deer hunting. Uh, I got sick for a little while. Had. A lot of family yeah. stuff going for Christmas and all that kind of stuff. So I, I got one early in the early in December, but I haven't nice. been out. But uh, I just came from came from Fisherman's, picked up my license for the new <laughs> before go. I got here, I know, and he funny. said they weighed in one that was over seventeen pounds today. Wow! Wow! Yeah. Uh, and like from the Willamette. Oh, that's even better. So, yeah, well, we're on the drop. Yeah, you know all the rivers like everywhere. It's on the drop. Yeah, it's clearing up. Everything's gonna be looking good now. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, but uh, at least so far it's sounding pretty good from what I'm right. hearing. Hopefully, it's not just a little yeah pilot run right. and then it drops and then it off. Drops off, it's been rough. Which you know, last does happen? Years. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So okay, what do we got here? Oh, there's mom. Yeah, mom caught that one back bouncing a prawn and on the sandbar. Nice <laughs> after school. So that, that was like my senior year of high school where we uh, fished every. Every evening after school. Oh, yeah. I'd get home and hook up the boat to the truck. My dad would get home, and we'd head out and and uh, hit the Willamette and, and hit the Clackamas for, all for Springers. Nice. So we fished five, six days a week when I was a kid. I yeah. still try to. Yeah. I still try to. I, I try not to. <laughs> now, this is this where I remember way back when you told me that when you were working in fisheries, you saw the salmon follow scent trails and things, that's and that's right. kind of where you learn about that. Right, that was a fish hat. Yep, that was a fish hatchery I worked at in Southeast Alaska, and uh, out in front of the hatchery there was a big 
shallow area roped off, you know, and all those salmon were coming back. And yeah, I'd mess around with my eight gears, and all those people thought I was crazy. <laughs> See with if things. they would go and hit it. Yeah, like kind of get close. Yeah, and I'd use a eight weight fly rod with a five out hook and a gob of eggs. I'd wow. sling it out there and you know, the eggs would be sinking down and you could literally see the white trail of milk coming off. Yeah. And I mean, there was like 500 shit up there. One would swim by and it would hit that line of scent and like 90 degree turn and just swim right up and gobble up those eggs. Wow. So it was just- it was That's fun. awesome. You know, that was like, I didn't go go down and catch a couple, you know, after see if work. This cure we worked, works. <laughs> we worked like eight, nine hours a day and, and then had free time after that. What got you into the hatchery stuff? You know, well, I mean, I always wanted to be a fishing guide, but, you know, then the folks are like, oh, you better go to college and yeah. stuff, you know, so you have something to fall back on. So I went to school for fisheries, you know, and there's a lot that that was at Mount Hood. Yeah, they had a good program. I mean, there's, there. I would say there's at least 12 to 20 guides that all have gone through that program. <laughs> so, That's awesome. Yeah. Hmm. That's my biggest personal springer. Cop that during college. Wow, where did that one come from? Pump house hole, back bouncing, uh, okay. eggs in there. That was 33 pound. Wow. On the clack? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, I haven't fished the clackmas for for springers for probably 18 years at least. Wow. You know, they took away pretty much, or A did something to that run. You yeah, know, they I don't know if they actually took it away, but something has shifted. Yeah, it's not. There's so um, few in there, though. I, I suspect <laughs> that the shifting came from over the, all these years, they used to sell all the surplus fish. So they get in, right. you know, they only need 300 or 500 or whatever fish to make a run. Well, they get 2,000 back, so they'll sell 1,500 of them. Well, they'll sell the first 15, the one 1,500 that show up in April or May. Right. Because those are the best quality. They're going to get the most money. They would sell those. And then they've been doing that since the 80s. So yeah. every year that they sell off the early ones and just spawn the ones that came in at the end of the run. Right. Artificially have moved that run so late into the year that the river's not fishable for springers anymore. Yeah. It's too warm. It's too warm. Yeah. Well, like I remember one year, it was it, it, the river was so warm. There were so many fish floating out that were dead. Yeah, that was like well, a that. A few years ago. Yeah, yeah, in yeah, 2015. The shoots, the, everything did, yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. So are you still are you still pretty heavy into working with the hatcheries? And I, I do, yeah. I, I volunteer a lot down there on the Trask Hatchery. Yeah. That's close to home, so it works out in the fall. I mean, I still love working with the fish, so it works out usually when the rivers are blown out. Right. And I have to cancel a trip well that's the day they get their fish in yeah so i'll go help them a lot are, you, are they doing a broodstock program down there are you um so that the trask hatchery has the wilson's broodstock right. steelhead for steelhead and then this is the third year that we've been collecting wild coho, for coho yeah. so we're switching to a coho broodstock oh nice yeah and then the chinook are just their general or their traditional chinook that's awesome. Is so you started the coho three years ago? Yes. That's awesome. So you also work with what is it, the Tillamook Estuary uh, Partnership? You're yeah, the, that's uh, a board of directors. Something? Yeah, I'm on their board of directors, and uh, they mostly do enhancement, mm -hmm. um, you know, re culvert removal, habitat enhancement. But they they also have water monitoring that we're funded from the EPA, so we test water. They test water. They have one, we have one guy that tests water for us. Um, we do a lot of um, education. They do several things. They work with all the kids. All, every fourth grader in Tillamook County goes through their the, uh, their program. Right. Um, they teach kids about the ecosystems and the fish and the estuaries and all that kind of. Thing. I remember having like a. Like one of the fish tank eggs. Yeah, you know, the Northwest, salmon eggs. Yeah, Northwest Steelheaders have done that yeah. for a long time. So you you and I fished a lot around here. You grew up fishing around here. Now you moved to Tillamook. Mm -hmm. How many years has it been? Uh, might be 19 years. Nine, okay, so it's been a while. Jeez, time has just flown by, yeah. especially the last 10 just vanished. It's, yeah. It's crazy. So what are what are your fisheries for the people who don't know? Like what what kind of how does your gear work um when, so starting now winter uh -huh. steelhead um mm -hmm. and that goes till early april yeah early april i'll do columbia springers and then 
later April and May, Willamette Springers. Now, last year, um, I had to travel a couple of times. I kind of missed the April fishing on the Willamette, but they extended that Columbia yeah. several times. So I had a really good Springer season on the Columbia, and I fished mm -hmm. that all the way last year because they kept extending it as the, they upgraded the run. So I fished that into the middle of July last year. Okay. And it got uh, really good in July. Yeah, it was really good. It was it was crazy. And then yeah, then after that I kind of just switched back to home and fished um Ocean Coho out of Garibaldi. Nice. And uh kind of did that all into the fall. And I, you know, buoy tanned and then back down to Tillamook and that area. Would you for, switch off and on for like buoy tan fishing when fall yeah. snook's going hot and heavy? Are you up you know, are you up there? I, I do. I'll move around. Yeah. You'll move around mm -hmm. for sure. Right on. So, we got Greg Rhodes, is the new Trask Fish Hatchery building for Springers only? Is no, the they have everything in there. They're gonna, they're gonna. I think they're gonna tear down the old hatchery, the old hatchery building anyway. That new one is very nice. Really, um, water purified, you know, purified water, and really nice incubators and all, everything. It's so they're gonna really focus nice. on. Not just one species. All, gonna, all the fish. Gonna, all the fish are. Yeah, all the fish are in there. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. That was a good question. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So, what's one of your like? What you know? I don't want to catch you off guard here. Guard here, but like a memorable moment in your fishing career, like something that might stand out. Uh, like a new adventure or a special day with clients or oh, I don't know, you know. There's a lot like that. Yeah, I know. I'm just trying to trying to think of some different things to talk about. Yeah. So I remember one of the things that we did, I don't know if exactly together, but we both went up to the New Shigak, mm -hmm. um, you know, at the same time period. I don't remember your exact schedule, but I know we fished up there at least alongside each other and that was kind of a big deal. Remember, yeah, yeah. remember that there was that day. So we were up there, you know, I was guiding You'd came up there, um, like the first week of their clients. Oh, right. Yeah. Right? I remember and my, this now. my dad yeah, was there right, to help right. set up camp and stuff too. Uh -huh. And the fish just did not come in. Right. Like, yeah. There was like none. Like we some caught chips, some jacks, yeah. which were pretty nice ones. Actually, I caught like, but. <laughs> I, we boated like 10, this is the Nishik, Nishigak now, you know, and I boated 10 Chinook in five days. I'm like, man, I could have done better than this in the class. <laughs> <laughs> and because the fish just didn't show up. And uh, up there, for whatever reason, when the wind really blows, yeah. it pushes the fish into the yeah. bay. Yeah, every time. And every time. Yeah. And but while the fishing was bad, we'd keep keep hearing rumors that all oh, the the nets caught them down in the bay. The fish yeah. are on their way. <laughs> right. Next day, fishing would suck. You know. <laughs> Next day, we kept hearing that. And uh, on the last day of that week, the clients were leaving, and. Uh, but we heard from like the actual fish and wildlife, the wind had blown, and right. so it was gonna we maybe be good. Heard we're that the fish coming. were coming, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I had I, of my four clients, two of them were like, "Ah, we've heard that before." We we're uh, we we're sleeping in on our yeah. last day because we offered. We're like, "We'll get up at four o'clock and get you out and fish," you know, so you have to catch your plane at nine or whatever, and make and, some good. Good judgments. And two, like, hey. got, two, two of the guys slept in, so I had the other two clients, and then I took Nick and I took my dad, nice. and we caught sixty by nine o'clock that morning. Sixty, yeah. When that 60 place kings. turns on, it turns I mean, on. We were letting out. We we're using magnum wiggle warts, and they were going out. The Chinooks were taking them off the surface. Off the flat them out. Flatlining flat oh, them out. Floating man. out. They were hitting them like largemouth bass. It was so hot. And that day, they, they caught like 100 off the bank. <laughs> right. Remember? Yeah, yeah, guys were plunking and bobber fishing and stuff. Our rods were going off. Yeah. And boats got doubles. Or <laughs> that was pretty <laughs> memorable. Yeah, that was yeah I was going to say 60, yeah. you know, Chinook. Yeah. Jeez. And then another thing, I mean, a mini, but that I just off the top of my head, I was paging through some of the old magazines and... There I see your dad with a giant Chinook, so... That uh, was on the Skeena. Right, so yeah. this is a whole separate thing. But, yeah, so you went up to the Skeena for a few years. Yeah. I'm, sure, I'm not sure how many, but I don't Couple. know that I was up there. But, yeah, that was like, you know, pursuing trophy kings right. and possibly... The see how big you right. can get. Yeah. yeah, I was going up there with friends, and, and mm -hmm. we were fishing and, and talking on the boat how, yeah. you know... Used to be way back on the Kenai, it's like they always brag, we don't keep anything over under 50 pounds. 
That's what they used to say on the Kenai. What? They released everything under 50. And all those big fish are gone now. Yeah. And, and at Tillamook, you know, you, we've seen a few pictures. You know, yeah. It used to be like that at Tillamook, too, and now they're gone. So we're talking, like, well, as we're fishing, I go, you know what? If I caught a really big one, I'd probably let it go. Just so it can, it can be able to do its thing. So like those big ones. Hope to would come back. Yeah. And later that day, uh, my friend's wife hooked into one, a monster, and we ended up being able to get it to a gravel bar, landing it, got our measurements, photos, and released it. And it measured out, it'd be about 67 pounds. Yeah, and we released it. So that was pretty, that was on the Skeena. Right. You know, and they were right. a big one. We, that one with my dad was 50 plus. You know, yeah, we, we yeah, caught 40s and 50s. Yeah, how many were over like 50 or 40? A lot, of them, 50. Over, a lot yeah. of them over 40. Big, big average size. Yeah. It used to be. So it was a fight every fish. It was, was it just... Yard. Oh no! It's no, serious we, business. Yeah, we catch. It wasn't as it. It was better than the Kenai, and had just as big a fish. Yeah. But it wasn't as good as numbers as the Nishigak. But you know, all those rivers are wiped out. They're gone. You That's know crazy. that kind of fishing is gone. And then uh, what else? I remember. So the one thing I remember about you when we were young is even when you first started guiding. Mm-hmm. You'd go fishing on your days off, like every time. Like there was that's no, how we fished together a lot. That yeah. was that. Yeah, there was no slowing you down. You would be like, okay, let's go hike Eagle Creek, like yeah, the whole afternoon or the whole day. You know, from the hatchery down to the bridge. Yeah, we did All a lot of, of, crazy lot, stuff. of <laughs> a lot of hiking around in there for sure. And then yeah. uh, we did, you know, kind of learn together the jig fishing way back when. Yeah, and all that. You know, Eagle Creek only got like seven fish back or something. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm not. I've got to figure out what's going on. I think they're using the Clackamas stock, and they're. I've heard that. Yeah, that's what I've heard. I don't think they're putting them out of the the federal hatchery up top, but I'm not even sure what's going on. So that might be why they might don't get up there, releasing them lower down. But we'll figure that out because that was one of my favorite fisheries for years. How good that was! Oh, it's lights out. You heard of one o'clock rock? Well, well yeah. <laughs> probably not. Yeah. Sure yeah. Cool. You, you've been there. You just don't know. Yeah. Well, I know, like, we were fishing, like, Tony and I, we were fishing out, you know, on the creek, and Tony's like, it was the end of the day. He's like, cast at this one rock. There's going to be a fish. And I, like, snag up. Mm-hmm. First cast, rip it, and I'm, like, tying. And Tony's like, well, he's not going to wait. Tony's going to fish, you know. He literally first cast fish on like <laughs> and this thing was huge it was probably like one of the biggest i mean i had to chase that thing <laughs> he chased, i mean tony like tony's like it's on and then it just peels line and gone and tony's gone i didn't even see him and then here comes tony you know nice yeah. big i would i would say it was maybe at least 12 pound 15 maybe <laughs> Yeah, I mean, everything just kind of keeps changing, and then we go through cycles, you know, remember the, you know, the 2000s, fish everywhere, the 210 yeah. again, and now it's kind of, it's hard to say, there are lots of coho, and, yeah. you know, some, some really good fisheries. We but. probably won't see, what, the early, like, 2000, 2001, 2002, I mean, those... Were, I'm hoping we do. I'm yeah. waiting. <laughs> I mean... We, was it just huge numbers everywhere? Yeah, yeah. it was just perfect mm-hmm. storm of high water in the spring and excellent ocean, and everything worked out. It was, like, the best. Feed everywhere for yeah. them, and... Yeah. Just tremendous survival on those fish. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that's when it was. Uh, well, how about we go through there, your. There's one there from. That was in the early 2000s. That, that's the biggest that I've caught. had somebody catch while I was guiding. It was like 52 pounds. Nice. Caught that out outside the jaws of Tillamook trolling herring out there. Sweet. That's the second biggest there. That one was Auburn eggs. That early was, 2000s? That one was 97, I think. 98? Yeah. That one, Keller's, is 98. That was on bobber and eggs. 48 pounds. <laughs> I can only dream. That's my very first guided trip. Right there? Yeah. <laughs> really? Yeah, my first guided trip ever. That's what's, like, were you nervous? Like, what was the, was it kind of nerve-wracking, or was it like you're just going to go with Uncle Nick and yeah, kind yeah. of go fishing with some buddies that, you know? It was, yeah. I mean, and, and we caught five that day. I, I remember we would we would have limited out. So for me, like, if I do, if something's going to cost me a fish, I'm never going to do it again. And the funny thing is those guys, one of those guys brought their own fishing rod. Yeah. And 
and they broke their fishing rod and lost the fish and everything like that. And like, now I'm, nobody's ever going to bring their own <laughs> fishing rod on my boat. Like, what rod are you using? Yeah. Well, the whole rod broke yeah. and everything, you know, so. That's funny. Trust your, trust yourself. Yeah. No one else. Yeah. There's a early picture of uh, when my family was young, sturgeon fish in Astoria. That's changed a lot. Yeah. Well, it's it's super good if you go during the catch and release time. Yeah. Have you fished down there? Yeah. Once? Yeah. So th- uh, this was actually yesterday. Nice. We went out above the upper the upper Columbia, yeah. and we went to a spot I've never fished, and I took a couple you know old friends that I've known for years, like family friends, mm-hmm. and I was like, hey, let's go give it a shot. You know, it's the opener. That it was yesterday, so Sunday. Mm-hmm. Or Monday, and then what Sunday? It what is it open every three days? Or? It's open. I think it's open Monday, Wednesday, and Saturday. Okay. But the for the opener, they opened it up on the first. Oh, okay. And then they did it double for Monday. But mm. it was actually. Re- I mean, it, for from what I heard from other boats, it was mm-hmm. pretty good all around. But you finally got some good weather. I mean, yeah. a lot of times that season it's so cold. It was and it, nasty like, up there. It was crazy. Like I was talking to them, and I was like. We're fishing in January, like it's not freezing. There's some snow up in the hills, yeah. But there was hardly any wind. I mean, that's prime time for sturgeon. Yeah, like, you can not have it windy up there, yeah. right? <laughs> in the it, winter, it was funny because like we we were like we're driving up and it's just blowing sideways, mm. like cascade, and you're like, oh, I don't know, boys, we might not make it up there. And then we got <laughs> up higher and it was dead calm, mm. and we found two keepers. Mm. Nice. That's a chrome. I, I caught that one with you, Nick, on the Gold River. Yeah, yeah that looks like a <laughs> different kind of fish, doesn't it? Yeah. Look wow. like, <laughs> do they even make those anymore? <laughs> well, those are, geez, there's no tidewater. That's like right out of the ocean. Yeah. <laughs> like, look how that was in that, that, that was in that canyon pool or whatever we had to hike way down into. Yeah, right. That's right. We went down in the, yeah, geez, that brings back some memories. Yeah. Way back when. How old were you guys back then? Do I even want to ask? Help. Your mid twenties, yeah, mid twenties, early twenties, spring chickens. Yeah, there's the sure. first fish I ever caught on a pink worm. Oh! Nobody, nobody fished pink worms in Oregon. It was just kind of <laughs> almost a rumor about using pink worms. Could you have possibly started the trend? <laughs> I think in so. Oregon. Well, we definitely, or maybe pretty, in the Northwest. Pretty, they, pretty they close. Were, they were using them up in British in Columbia BC, for a long yeah. time, but I don't, I don't remember seeing many people down here. Yeah, them. I mean, we, we thought it, it was like a joke, you know. I mean, yeah, like, we went into the fishing store, and you know how you go here, and they have all the racks of all the different corkies yeah. up mm-hmm. there. When we went to the sporting goods store in Canada, it was. All these si- shapes and sizes of pink worms, but they're all pink. Nothing right. else, Nothing but just color. different shades of pink. <laughs> right. And you know, we all joked about it and stuff. stuff. And that picture in there, mm-hmm. me and Nick walked into a spot, and I found that pink worm on the on the trail. Yeah. And uh, we got started fishing, and I was just goofing around, and I, I mean, I still thought it was a joke, and I stuck <laughs> it on my hook and said, "Hey, Nick, watch this," and cast it out, and I caught a fish. Was it with <laughs> bobber or drifted? With the bobber. With the bobber. Yeah. Wow. And, yeah, uh, so it yeah it's been going. We on. came back oh, from there and we're talking about it and stuff, mm-hmm. and it just kind of spread from there. Really. Yeah, pretty much. And then it, it was obviously effective yeah. on the home waters. Yeah, yeah. steelhead is a steelhead. Dave Vetter started writing about it mm-hmm. in the magazine, and then it kind of started to really take off. That's awesome. Later. Wow. But hey, so why don't you go through your progression as a steelhead guide and kind of you know tell us a little bit about what you what you do or um how things have changed too it is i i haven't fished with you in a while i assume right. you're probably bobber dog in these days mostly bobber dog yeah. okay so you know and i'm like still like yeah i mean does anybody even side drift anymore does anybody not too much yeah yeah it's kind of gone huh yeah <laughs> you know i would say the progress you know like when we started it was drift fishing right yeah you know we'd anchor the boat or shore fish and you'd stand there with your started out with just pencil lead and then yeah. i remember it switched to slinkies early in those early days yeah and you know it was just drift fishing and you know you had to really feel it be able to feel the fish well and all that kind of thing like that um but then i think it was just a progression of you know the steelhead or just they're big trout, and it's all about presentation and color, that kind of thing. Yeah. And dead drift, like a trout would like. Yeah. And when you're drift fishing, you only get that little bit 
of drift where it's dead drifted and then it's on the swing. Right. So you'll catch some fish doing it. But if you can get it to drift, dead drift the whole way, you'll catch a lot more, a lot fish. more. And that's where bobbers came in. Right, right. Yeah, because it gives them that natural presentation. Um, and then, you know, we were all drift fishing. And then actually me and you went up to the cowlets and everybody was side drifting. We caught, yep, caught fish right. side drifting. Mm-hmm. And I thought, man, this would be awesome. You know, nobody was doing that on the climb yeah. of us. It was like diver and bait. And... Literally, I mean, my whole life, my best day on the Clackamas out of a sled was like three fish ever. And yeah, it's always been a tough river. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we went to the Cowles. We caught a whole bunch of fish side drifting. And uh, I thought, man, this is awesome. We're going <laughs> to slam on the Clackamas doing this. We went back. I tried it on the Clackamas. And you just broke off left and right. Oh, yeah. Because no. on the Cowles, we were side drifting with pencil lead. Right. And it just sticks in that those clay ledges and stuff on the clock. Oh, yeah. So I gave up on it. I was like, yeah, this sucks. <laughs> and didn't do it. And, and then I'd gone, then like the next year, I tried it down at the coast. And still, everybody fished out of a drift boat was either pulling plugs or anchored in drift fishing. Yeah. And we started side drifting down there and started slaying the fish. The numbers went up. Way up. And because it's a much more natural drift. So this is, this yeah. is between drift fishing and bobber fishing. We were side drifting. And it and you cover so much more water and get such a more natural drift right. than you know, it I mean it was double digits all the time. <laughs> and eventually and, and then I took it back to the Clackamas and see the thing that changed was uh, while I was doing it on the coast, I had switched over to slinkies. And when I went back to the Clackamas one time, I tried it and we caught like three fish like in an hour. And I'm like, oh, I'm on to something. Yeah, you're on to something. I'm going to do this, try this again tomorrow. Went out the next day, caught like five. I'm like, oh. man, this is the best day I've ever had on yeah. the Clackamas. I'm on to something. <laughs> and we were using slinkies that didn't hang up. Right. So that's, uh, I mean, you know, for several years, we were the only ones doing it. Yeah, I remember when that all started. There were just a few. Boats. Yeah, it was like first. I remember seeing like it was more. like Dave Frogner, Forrest would even do. You know, those guys would not. They, really? they didn't even oh, want. Yeah, they, they didn't, didn't want, even it. want to do it. Yeah, they used to make fun of us. Oh sometimes. yeah, they they uh, <laughs> right, and, and you know the. Oh like, yeah, like I Greg. actually can't say it, but now I remember what they used to. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no. They were they were saying, "What are you guys doing?" Uh, uh, it was to rock and fish, draggers. But uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, and they were still like, like Greg was still catching like two or three a day pulling plugs, yeah. and we were doing eight to twelve a day. You know, and eventually it all caught on. It and, caught on, and it was this good because right. everybody's doing the same thing. Well, then. Somebody comes along and decides to put the bobber on there. And that changed they, everything. And that changed everything. They started catching more than everybody else. Yeah. And this was at the coast and not, not so much the clockmas, but it spread everywhere. But mm-hmm. yeah, but then the bobber gives it that much more natural drift than side drifting. Right. It's a big presentation change. Right. That whole presentation and change, that's where the beads came in too. You know, back in the day, we drift fished with corkies right. mm-hmm. and okies, you know, like, but I think why the reason the bead, uh, and actually we switched from that to those yarnies. Remember, we used yep, to tie up so many yarnies. I remember time. seeing a bunch of liters of next yeah. yarnies. Yeah. And those yarnies outfished, they outfished eggs, they outfished bait. And it's because it's more of a yeah. natural Presentation flowing. flowing through the water and like that. Everybody forgot about the Jensen egg too. I mean, we use those, and we never fished them right though. <laughs> yeah, you know? True. Yeah, I always use them. We put them I'd on the hook. hook. Yeah, you use them to hold the shrimp tail. Right, right. Way. Or, or you just put a Jensen egg on the hook and put a little bit of yarn. But yeah, it yeah, was it wasn't right. the same as the way we do it now. Yeah. And anyway, those yarnies were out fishing the other way. And then when the beads came along, you not only had the neutral buoyancy that the yarny provided. The, the beads float neutral float a little bit more. But they also, the light shines through them like a real egg. You know, it's translucent. Yeah. And that is just one more step back. Yeah, you even got the camera right there. Oh, okay. So these are the couple of rigs I got that oh, I yeah. usually run here. Let's go slow. That's a, that's a soft bead, and it's held on there with a little T-bead to it. Now, how much do you think this would change, like, if you could have ran this 
Like in your early Steelhead career. Oh, it would have been insane because of, you know, they'd never seen it before. And every time, every technique that comes along right. is way better than everything else until everybody does it. And how and many then, pounds of borax or whatever you use. Yeah. <laughs> so here's one more rig here that I... So this is with a hard bead. I brought this to show. If I do a hard bead, see this, the soft bead has the T bead. Right. The hard bead, I use a bobber stop and I super glue it. So that's one little trick or a little, a super glue is a nice little tool that people can use. I super glue that bobber knot, keeps yeah. it in place. I mean, eventually it'll break off if you catch a, you know, break loose, if right. you catch a fish or snag up, that kind of thing. But um, it really keeps it from sliding down to the hook. So when you go, when, like when you go out on trips, yeah, are you using mainly like do you use a mixture of soft beads, hard beads? Uh, depends on the water and what. I, if I'm if it's heavy water, I'm usually using a lot of lead and dragging the bottom a lot more. I'm right. using soft beads. And then if it's like real low and clear water, then I'm using more like split shots or just a little bit of lead. And then I'll use a hard Off the bead. leader. Yeah, and then I'll use the hard bead so it kind of sinks down. Sinks better. down. Yeah. And then you were talking about your, instead of using your bead, yeah. like a, a small bead versus a big bead. Oh, here's a question. What's we a got a question. Here? Cerise? That's a Cerise, right? Cerise. There. Yeah. Oh, the color. Yeah, that's Cerise. That's the old school, the first orange one that every hard bead that... Most yeah. people were using yeah, that's it, where it kind of started. when it started, yeah. and then they would take their fingernail polish and and change it up yeah, and that kind of thing. But paint the bag and you guys were doing that. All kinds of yeah, all kinds the of crazy. Now, now there's so many on the market. You don't. Know, it's I mean, like Baskin yeah, Robbins. Yeah, there's one flavor. I've got like 200 bottles of fingernail <laughs> polish, and I don't even use them anymore. <laughs> so you got to go back to this. You were talking okay, go about back, yeah, go back to that uh, bobber setup there instead of. Instead of using a bead, I mean, how many people have, you get a bead that's too small, too small, it goes through your eye, all the way to the reel, and gets stuck up in the rod, so then you got to go with a bigger bead, but then the bigger bead has a bigger hole that goes over your bobber stop, right, so like three or four, maybe even five or six years ago, I don't know how time flies, I went to using a sequin instead of a bead, those are the sequins you get at the bead store, or craft store, or whatever. And uh, so I'll, I'll use those instead of using. Oh, beads. you can use them on the bottom too. Yeah, just to keep it from just in place of a in place of a bead. And and I'll use them sometimes. You can use them below your. Uh, if you have a regular bead that uh, is going over your bobber stop, like if it has a, too big of a hole, you can fish it, one of those in between as well. So we have a question. John says, "So super glue doesn't give." a scent obviously you are catching fish with it right so does, um, it, give, does it change the present like scent trail of it, using super glue you either, know if you want to get real technical right. it, it either loses your scent or loses it its scent or they like it one way or the other <laughs> <laughs> could that be the trick it, it could be you know and i'll use super glue on other things too like peak worms onto a uh, jig head too i right. use it use it a lot for that and i'll use it if i'm if i'm making up my own bobbers where i'm like attaching lead to it or something like that then I'll use super glue. So I, yeah. And, and, and um, you get the super glue that's a gel is a lot better than the real liquidy stuff, but both work. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. What, um, I'm trying to think of some more stuff that we did when we were younger. So I remember one time I stayed out too late. You and Sam picked me up, and we won't go into too many details, but um, <laughs> oh, yeah, I remember that, but that was one of the first times uh, I think you guys were introduced to jig fishing. Or <laughs> well, the first time we were, I was I was introduced, or at least maybe those jigs that I had <laughs> could could be, yeah. <laughs> Because I made a short day of it, if I remember correctly. <laughs> I caught a couple fish and I passed out. Pretty much. On the river. <laughs> yeah, I fell asleep as a time. This was, cat now. This was New yeah. Year's Day. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Nick hadn't been, to, he hadn't been to bed yet. Pick, yeah, picked me up at like 4 in the morning or something. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And yep. Uh, anyway, that was a great day, if I remember correctly. I think we, I think we it limited was like, out and uh, some. Yeah, it was... It was one of those really good days. Steelhead fishing? Yeah. Yeah. 
So how's Sam doing? I haven't seen heard of him. Yeah, heard from he him works a lot, and then yeah. you know, kids and stuff. So he ha- he hasn't fished a lot. Uh, the fishing he does is like for springers yeah. or on the Columbia out of his sled. But uh, I haven't we I haven't fished with him for probably you know really? I've fished in the last decade I've fished with him as much as I fished with you so oh boy that's yeah, not that a lot you know changed. yeah we should all get back together sometime yeah on a trip that'd be fun <laughs> so yeah. yeah the first time the first time I used well I mean way back in the eighties Bradbury right right you know did seminars and all the stuff about his jigs, but I didn't catch any on those. And because I didn't know any better and I fished it like a drift fisherman and I would cast my bobber out and just let it swing like drift fishing. And I never caught a fish. Right. You know, because the key is to have it, your bobber straight Straight up and down down. and that nice natural drift. I didn't know that as a teenager. Yeah. So I was like, yeah, these things suck. And then when I met Nick um, and I met Nick through, a Navy buddy of my dad's that was a neighbor to your dad. Right. And yeah. uh, he invited me. He goes, oh, you got to come to this Christmas party and meet Nick Amato. I'm like, really? Oh, that'd be awesome. You know, so <laughs> we you know, met and planned a fishing trip. And the first time we fished, you were using jigs. Oh, okay. Probably Bradbury jigs? No, you are using the Bomac. Oh, that I was already. Okay, so used. I was using those. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> you know, we're doing my old, same old drift fishing, pulling plugs kind of stuff. And I, I Nick's like, let me take some cast. No, he was annoying me, man. He, you know, we're yeah, floating down the river, and he's throwing this right. jig all over the place, and I'm like, ah, stupid jig, you know. And we we were anchored in a hole, and uh, drift fishing the top of the hole, you know, and then the hole he gets deeper and slower down yeah. below us. And Nick's like, you ever catch any down there? And I'm like, nah, that's that's frog water. You don't catch any steelhead in that. Nick free spools his jig like out of sight, way down there, and all of a sudden he's all fish on. Yeah. He gets a fish, you know, and he catches it. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. He calling on a yeah. jig. Like three or four more casts later, he's like, fish on, gets another one. Well, I was driving you guys nuts because you were anchoring up and then you could only drift fish in front. And I kept blow hole on the yeah. boat or whatever with the plugs. You were low hole on the plugs? Yeah, well. Yeah, well well, they were so, drift fishing, I think. I yeah. Correctly. So then I'm like, oh, there's something to that. You know, we moved down and Nick's got, he's got a couple rods. He's like, you can use mine if you want. You're, you know, use that other one. I'm like, all right. And I'm like sitting in my drift boat, eating a sandwich, cast out. Nick gets another one. I'm like, holy crap, I'm going to try this thing. And then I call him. I'll yeah. water under the bridge since then. Yeah. Right, <laughs> right conditions. Those work pretty well. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> so we have another comment. For for false for false Chinook in the rivers, eggs or beads, and if running bead egg loops, eggs on a loop. Oh, and if running bead eggs on a loop. I, I like to go one or the other, really. But I mean, I'm going to use mostly eggs if I'm fishing for Chinook. But I will say that these bigger soft beads, the 20 mils, 20s and 24s and stuff, um, have worked pretty good in the last two years. I, I started using those big ones like three years ago up on the Togiak. And uh, they were out fishing eggs on those fish. I mean, they're a lot more aggressive fish, but we were, mm-hmm. we were out, the big soft beads were out fishing real eggs. Are you putting any scent on that? Um, yeah, I'll put a little shrimp scent or something on that. Something usually. to give it a little. Yeah. But super, super glue. Super, super glue. Yeah, super glue. <laughs> That's going to be the new thing now. Everyone's going to have a <laughs> hot gun. Just yeah. super glue and everything. And then so, uh, you rub a little banana on it. A little, yeah, banana. little banana. <laughs> so, yeah, I would uh, definitely use eggs more, you know, if I'm schnook fishing. But... Um, if I can mix it up and have three or four rods going, I have been fishing one rod with soft bead and, and someone's catching some fishing fish. a bead. Yeah. Um, awesome. and coho too. I actually, I've caught a lot of coho just bank fishing and stuff on, uh, with on soft bead. beads. Yeah. With soft beads. So what's your thought on color? Let's just go with color. Do you kind of stick with certain things or you just kind of mix it up and or do you bring the whole warehouse yeah. of colors? No, I mean, I've, of course, I have a whole warehouse, but you always gravitate to your favorites. Um, yeah, right. Just kind of match your color to the to the water conditions. To the water conditions. Yeah. You know, more, you know, brighter when it's dirty. Yeah. 
Now, I remember way back when, I think you really liked to use, what, a blue corky or something? You were all I, that. is that, my right? favorite, yeah. I steal that stuff. I got a blue bean? <laughs> I've got blue beans. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't fished them as much because I kind of gravitate to my yeah, favorites okay, already. Well, but, I just um, kind of pull that out of thin but air. But we do, yeah, yeah blue, you're right. Blue or something. You're right. I always yeah. liked a metallic blue corky. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> For sure. That's funny. You know, it's a, it's a color that... It's a color people aren't using. Yeah. Blue plugs are my favorite plug for stealing, too. Looks like you got a picture coming up here. Yeah, that was back around high school or so. Do you, uh, people might not know or remember or whatever, but in the lagoon, the Oregon City Lagoon, um, behind the Oregon City Shopping Center, uh, we used to raise north of steelheaders, had net pens, oh. and we would release springers and steelhead in those net pens. And that's what, that's my dad there. And, um, we were using our boat to put in those net pens, and I don't know if that ever. That have been cool if it kept around. Like. That's what the idea was, yeah. But I don't know. There were fin clip different too, you know, than normal uh, adipose clips. In fact, I don't even know if they had. We had adipose clips back then, but they had a fin clip on them so we could try and. And see if they, but if those were returning. If they into returned, that. and I don't remember, they maybe they never it never worked out because they don't do it anymore. But I mean, that was thirty plus years ago, so maybe that's why we're getting a big return back. That's my second personal biggest fall chinook for Oregon. That was a forty six, and uh, I had my clients were were back bouncing, mm-hmm. and we were running a quick fish and back bouncing off the front and. They were getting fish after fish. I think they got like seven fish, and uh, it started to slow down. And I finally got a little bit of rest time, and I'm like, I'm gonna ca- cast my bobber over on the to the shore next to us, and I cast it over there, and bobber goes down. I hook that fish, and I offered to hand it off to them, and they're like, Oh no, we've caught enough this morning. Go ahead and bring it in. And uh, it, I mean, it didn't really fight a whole lot, you know, or whatever. It's a tank. Yeah, and I got it up, and the clients netted it for me. We brought it in the boat, and like, oh man, that's huge. Yeah. <laughs> They're yeah. like, oh man, we I mean, missed out. Yeah, if I would have known, I, I would have let it go, really. You know, yeah. At, at that point, I think that was in about 03. Here we go. Yeah, I've got it in Alaska. I've done Sitka. That was halibut fishing up there in Sitka. Are you still doing any guiding in Alaska? Um, no, I've done I've done some short term, uh, like for two weeks on the Togiak, but um, that was again way back in the in the nineties, and I'd go up all summer. So I've done Sitka, I've done Togiak, Nishigak. Those were some Nishigaks, uh, big kings. They don't get that big there anymore either. Yeah, I remember that. They, you yeah, get the that was that. That, 30, that was 40, 50, that was the same year yeah. that we were talking about earlier, where we caught the sixty that morning. This was um, the same river. The same river, but at the end of the season. Was the wind blowing? Uh, no, it's like once it start, once <laughs> yeah, they, they started, they just, they just keep coming. It keeps coming. Yeah, yeah. but uh, those were all forty plusers and. Uh, I don't know if they were all that group. I don't know if all those fish were caught on the same day because they were there for like five days. But with those guys, I caught 102 one day. Uh, we had 94 one day, 60 something. It was good fishing. And I don't know if all the all three of those big ones were caught. Um, do you think in we'll one ever, day or because it's the same group? They were those are all brothers. Do you think we'll ever? get back to that like era of fishing of size of, or, or size or even just qu- like you know i think our size is hindered because of they don't get to survive long enough right you know we got to change those treaties and get those alaskan guys off of those older fish right you know, they don't they don't get to live five or six years in the ocean anymore you think the numbers will even get like a sixty fish day. I mean, how many people do that now? They even still do. They still get that on the Nusha guy. Yeah, that they do. The, think, but a lot of I them think are it's jacks. the largest run in yeah. Alaska, isn't it? Yeah, Maybe. it's the largest fishable run. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh. So when you yeah. go fishing up there, it sounds like yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> no, <laughs> you want a challenge, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like challenges. Yeah. It's all I like the, the challenge. challenge. I mean, I, I'd rather catch ten down here than fifty there. So. That says a lot. That says a lot. Yeah. There's a sailfish from Mexico. 
I, you know, I, we used to go to Alaska a lot, and mm-hmm. I've gotten the taste for fishing in the warm water. Okay, well, yeah, so, so this is all new. This will, yeah, tell us So I've now. done Mexico, Hawaii, Florida. Um, Christmas Island is my favorite. That's, uh, it's 1,200 miles south of Hawaii. Wow. And uh, so I went there three out of four years, and then COVID, there's, that's off of Christmas Island. Those are giant Trevally. Yeah, boy. I, they fight they're good. tough, right? <laughs> they're harder than any fish ever. Really? Incredible. Yeah. Just sheer weight. Just power. Mm-hmm. I mean, you use a 60-pound drag. Our reels are 14 pounds that we use for salmon. Set And, and we usually like, set, don't even set them as tight as they yeah. can get. But like like a Dakota, yeah. I, I think most of our reels will be set like a fourteen pound, or the drag only goes to fourteen. I think a Dakota might go like twenty four pound. So the reels we're using on those Trevallis is got a sixty pound drag, Usually, and they're peeling like like it's nothing. Oh, I mean it's just. I mean <laughs> that fast, that fast. It, well, they are amazing fish. Yeah. What's the one on the right? Um, coral trout. Coral trout. Yeah, kind of a grouper. Like a group. I was yeah. gonna say it looks like a grouper. Yeah. Do you do you want to do that more now than? Oh, I would love to spend all winter down there. <laughs> <laughs> but th- it, they closed the border uh, March first of two thousand and twenty because of COVID, yeah. and they still haven't opened it yet. I bumped my trip. I'm supposed to go March eighth this year, and. Uh, it's they still have any they don't have any commercial flights in yet. Wow. Yeah, because the uh, airport's been closed for three years, so they I don't know if the runway is fixed or what, but yeah, you got to <laughs> try those fish. <laughs> I might even give up steelhead if I can fish. Well, really? <laughs> oh, oh man! Yeah. Oh, well, we know it. David's favorite fish, favorite fish is now, but they're pretty still, amazing. Still river for this guy. <laughs> yeah, what's that? That, that, was was here. that was a good morning in Oregon City. <laughs> we, 10 by 10 o'clock. Yeah, really good day. <laughs> so we caught those just to the uh, west of the lake line mm-hmm. in about 40 feet of water, back bouncing. And, uh, you know, the line was all lined up, and we were yeah. just fish after fish after fish. And then the next next morning, the whole hog line was over on that side they of the all river. <laughs> right. you know, like, it was crazy. Like, fishing in, like, years past, like, always remembering the hog lines, right? Yeah. Like, now you fish it, it's not even a thing. I mean, there's a few that are still there that, I mean, I, f- I forget the guy's name that's been, like, he's, like, 93 or <laughs> 94 now, and he's still out there really? yeah. fishing in the, like, fishing on the line, you know? Mm-hmm. But it's like, it's crazy how, how that fishery has even changed. Hmm. You know, it's like no more big hog lines right. all the way across the river. Probably two things, you know. Well, you'd, you'd say there's less fish, but really for the Willamette, it, it's in cycles. And, you know, if you look back for the last, I don't know, till the, from the 40s, I think maybe, like the average springer route on the Willamette over the falls is like 33,000. 33, yeah. Yeah. I mean, and that's kind of what we've been getting, you know. I mean, there's been years, and every maybe 10 or 12 years, there's a big bump, you know, when they have good conditions, good flow, that kind of thing. And, uh, you know, when they'll have up to 100,000. But I think just in those early 2000s when we had the perfect storm is when it was the biters. kind of consistently in 100,000 yeah. fish run. And when they say 100,000 fish, they're counting everything caught from the Willamette, Columbia, and all that kind of stuff. It was still over the falls. It was like seventy or 80,000. Right. And look at what we're projected this year. At, it's, uh, what was what, it? 71,000? Yeah, that's what they're, pre- and yeah. that's their prediction. So you'll probably get like 40 yeah, over, over the falls the fall. yeah. or something. Yeah. Less, hopefully but that's good fishing. That's, it is. But they've always been tough how to catch. Rich, how heavy... Uh, Braid. So Mike asked, how heavy a braid you using are you using when bobber dogging? 30 or 40. No, yeah, I, I've been using the Max Quattro 40. Okay. Um, but or I'll use uh Maxima 30 braid. Now do you do you mm-hmm. notice with certain lines like it floats better on the water or like mending for mending the line purposes? Um or does I, that even matter? I mean, I probably, I haven't used like 
I mean, how many brands are there? Right. 10, 15, you know. A I'm, million. I've only used three or four, so right. I can't tell you. I don't know what if some out there are better than, you know. I know from my others. experience, I'm sure you could, you know, split hairs and stuff. But if right. you're using a long rod. Makes and, a difference. And, yeah. A lot of times you want to leave the bow. In leave a little bow. Way. Right. Yeah. If you're depending actual bomber on, dog and yeah, you're dragging the weight. Yeah. The, the, yeah, the strategy you're using. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Got another question. We have another question. Cody says, how has the steelhead fishing been on the coast so far this year? Well, I can tell you one thing. So my buddy, Steve Henry, who I fished with um, since I was a kid, he's uh, been spinner bank fishing and he's landed over 25 keepers so far. So That's good fishing. He's doing good. But yeah. you know, I was fishing so What's that far. happened to me? <laughs> so he's a, sending me yeah. picture after picture. So there's some around. Yeah, I, I've only gone out. I only went out once. Um, I went out just uh, I don't know somewhere in the first week of December, I think, and, and caught one. Mm-hmm. Um, but then I, you know, just had stuff come up. Got sick. Been hunting. I, I've been hunting a lot. I've got a well, I have a deer tag, so that that's I, I've been deer hunting a lot instead of fishing. Nice. Get more, hey, more, you get a little more meat. Get a little more meat. Little more yeah. meat. But, uh, those bucks have been not, not too not run hard. Not hard enough. Well, I'm hearing better reports in general because I, I, yeah. I haven't been out either, to be honest. But I've <clears throat> talked to people who are out all day, it seems like sometimes. And uh, it seems like it's off to a better start. But we'll see. Yeah, it, 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 right. it does that sometimes. It does that Especially so I, with that early stock or right. you know, the water conditions might be perfect the water temp comes up a big batch comes mm-hmm. in and then or like you, you know, come off the flood and then it drop on the big drop I mean, right that's got to push right i mean right right yeah it, a lot of, I, I like it i the longer it's high and flooded yeah the better it is when it drops but it seems like on those winters when we have like high water you know i mean like every four or five days where it blows out Drops in, blows out, drops in. It's not Fluctuates nearly as, as much what you think. It kind of lets them all spread out instead right. of being high for a long time and then finally clearing up and then bam, they're there, you know. But <clears throat> yeah, I think not it's been big fish days. Yeah, I, I think it's been pretty good. Um, and like I said, yeah, like we said, hopefully it's not a not a uh, like an early pilot run and it peters out till the end of January or something. Right. And one thing I've always got to remember is. You know, just getting out fishing's fun. You know, sometimes yeah. like Dave and I have been doing it for a long time now, and we've seen these cycles go. Mm-hmm. But you know, any day is just a great day to and get on some, the water. Yeah. yeah, and some days uh, the best day could be one fish or even a fish getting off versus you know catching a whole bunch. I mean, yeah. somehow you just somehow turn into a, a, a crazier experience. Mm-hmm. For example, I had a neighbor fishing the Clackamas the other day, and uh, they put some plugs out. And they had a takedown. The fish jumped, came off. I mean, that's a good day. That's a, <laughs> that's a no, good day. It's, it's a uh, sub, like it's, it's, you're going to remember <laughs> that. <laughs> yeah. So well, that's how and, I would look at it. You, you know, being in the business and everything. You don't want to get caught up on the social media and seeing all these fish pictures. Either I know that is kind of tough because it just seems like you should always catch a chrome bright. Right, fish right. But every for every time. every one fish somebody right. puts on there, there's been twenty guys that didn't catch one that yeah. day. Yeah, you know. Yeah. <laughs> or how many hours? Did, yeah, you know. Did you put right. it? Right. A lot. Of, a lot of the shows and videos you watch. I mean, I, I know for experience <laughs> that it looks like. It's just fish on, fish on, fish on. Well, sometimes that's days. <laughs> right. Just, or weeks. Yeah. yeah. And I'll just put together. Remember when we did that show with Scott Hogan? Yeah, yes. <laughs> He's like, oh, we better do three day film for three days so we can get enough fish. And if we get two fish, maybe three, that could make a show. <laughs> right. Well, not. It you know how many we did. caught? How many? Well, our first day, we caught 12. <laughs> and, uh, and and he, he didn't get. It, it was like a lot of them were early in the morning. Oh, yeah. right. Now I know what now you're talking you know. about. Yes, a lot yes, of them yes, were yes, early okay. in the morning, yeah, right, so the right. lighting wasn't great. So we're like, let's go to the next day. And the next day we landed 21. <laughs> and then the third day we didn't even go fishing. <laughs> it was so yes, good. Was a good... <laughs> wow. But, you know, I mean. Hey, I, hey, I, was, I was talking to Robert Campbell. Yeah. And he said he went fishing with you to a place called Egg Rock. Remember Egg Rock? Egg 30 Rock. 30 years ago. Some antlers on the on the beach. I know he found some. Yeah, I remember a place. Where's that coming from? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. 
Yeah, I know. He was walking like six feet in front of me, and he's like, oh, look, an elk antler. You know, because they shed their antlers, and yeah. he goes like a little bit more, oh, there's another one. It was like a full set for this like five or six point. Oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> Yep, yep. Yeah, but, you know, we got those big days like that. But, you know, how many days have we gone fishing and not catch one or catch one? And that's the other thing people get don't realize, too, is, is just, yeah, how much time we've put in not catching. And then everybody wants it hand-fed to them, too. Oh, yeah. We're like, right. where to go and what, you know. It, it's like, you know, how many days have we gone to some river we've never been to and you know, the, right. we, we got the stories of log figure, jams and, it out and all and kinds of crazy right. stuff. That to me, I mean, when and I that's look fun. Back, that's, that's a whole adventure. Yeah. yeah, you know, obviously you want to catch some fish, but yeah, the, the adventure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when I go fishing on my own, still, mm-hmm. you know, it's just usually some place that I don't know. It's definitely not any place I usually guide. Mm-hmm. Or you know, I'm you know I'm not going to be on the Wilson River or the Nestucca River on my day off. More than likely than not, you know, right. I'm going to go walk some stream. And you're probably on a small stream. You know, the river might get 50 fish. So for the whole year, you're probably only going to catch one in a day. And that'd be cool. Yeah, yeah. it did happen. See new yeah, water and catch not, a fish. You know, not see too many people and have a nice mm-hmm. hike. Like yeah, that. absolutely. Sounds like I mean we need to be. Like catching 12, 15 fish every time we go out with you guys. <laughs> or 50 well, or 60. Well, you know, there's been years. <laughs> yeah, been years where it's like that. But, uh, yeah. Like you guys were talking about like Canada, going up in Canada and doing that fishing stuff together. Yeah. Like what was that like? So we went to the Gold River once steelhead fishing. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't know. What do you remember about that? I don't think we caught more than like maybe a dozen in a day. Mm-hmm. You but know, I mean, it, it was like good. That's my experience. All my my trips to Canada that I've gone, my trips to Alaska for steelhead when I've gone, um, it's been comparable to good fishing in Oregon. Yeah. You know, like we catch like six or seven a day and have a double digit day. Yeah. You know, you know, like a four or five day trip. That that's that's what I've yeah. experienced up on those northern rivers. Yeah. It has a. I mean, obviously, you've you've hit that gold at times when yeah, you guys I've, caught yeah, incredible numbers, out, see, but but they only have like ten fish come back or something this, now. Well, you know, yeah, or, yeah, it, yeah, they're back. Probably more they're probably that. back now. You can find one. Yeah, <laughs> but you know, it, it, yeah. it's definitely. So I always so I obviously had a lot of opportunity over the years to and, and drive and desire to go catch them, but. Mm-hmm. What really truly drives me is fishing in our wood drift boat or with my dad on the bank when I was, you know, early teens or, mm-hmm. well, younger than that even. Younger, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, I remember I had a, you know, warm coat, and that was about it, and uh, <laughs> jeans, and uh, maybe some gloves, and I remember I'd have to sit on my hand, and I'd have to have my dad drop me off on the bank just so I could run around. <laughs> so you could warm so up. So I could feel yeah. my feet. They'd be just completely <clears throat> numb. And then we would drift fish and drift fish, and there was no complaining, no whining. I mean, it's just, uh, <laughs> yeah. Can you know, only imagine what Grandpa Frank. <laughs> yeah, well, and I, you know, wrote about it and said before, but I didn't realize, you know, he's rowing the drift boat, so he's staying warm. He's sweating. And I'm <laughs> freezing to death up there, and I've got, yeah, whatever on my hands and cutting pencil lead. And, but I mean, and we, I'd hardly remember catching fish, especially in the Clackamas when we were doing that. Right. Once in a while we'd catch one. And right. Once in a while we'd get one on a plug, and then it was, you know, yeah. It was like a big deal. <laughs> yeah. I, I didn't catch my first one until the beginning of the third year of doing it. And, right. and there were, I mean, and we would fish down by High Rocks and Cross Park right. and trolley car and all that stuff. And back then, you'd have 50 guys on that bank. Oh, yeah. You probably don't have 50 guys in the entire year. On no the, way. On that bank now. No way. You know. You, you could you could count everybody for the you whole year. You go up to one, the Cross Park and look down and it's... <clears throat> Yeah, like, back, oh, this guy here and here. That's it. Back then, there'd be like shoulder uh, to shoulder. at Cross Park on the bridge. Yeah, there'd be thirty guys on each side from that Cross Park to the tail, or from the bridge to the tail out. You know, at least, and they were catching them. You know, they yeah, you know, at they, least a few. Ten, you get, yeah, you know, yeah. ten, twenty fish a day, a morning caught. But you know, we I didn't catch any. <laughs> yeah, that's really changed from when I started. You yeah, see, you have a lot of the the bank lineups and this type of thing, and everybody talking and drift fishing together. Well, I think it's because they don't have the early stock fish anymore. You know, those early mm-hmm. stock fish came back Christmas vacation. You know, so when everyone was home, they... everyone was home, and all the fish came back within a, a few 
weeks to two months ago. Right. So another question. So we have a question from Eddie or Edward Florence. He says, "What kind of weight do you use for bobber dogging?" I usually use slinkies. That's that's slinkies my over like pencil lead or yeah. Yeah, they just slide through so much better. Um, there's a lot of different, <clears throat> you know, leadless ones and weighted different weights and yeah. stuff like you can get now. Like the rubber coating ones with the, you know, the, the lead inside. Yeah, yeah. And, and um, the team, I think they, I mean, they're probably fine for fishing yourself. But, you know, when I got a couple of clients and they're, they catch a little bit more in the rocks and your bobber dips a little bit more. So people are always like, was that a fish or, you know, jerking, or at, jerking at it yeah. or whatever, where a slinky doesn't hang up nearly as much. It just slides through. And then I can make my slinkies, you know, three shot, four shot, five shot and kind of know by what the flow is, what size how right. shot I'm going to fish and, you know, have it figured out like that. Do you use a little, like, snap swivel to yeah. it so you can change out? Say you're, you're drifting down to a heavier section of water, mm -hmm. you're going to go, okay, I need a little bit more weight. Right, Quick right. change. Yep, a little uh, snap, just a snap swivel, and then um, on the slinky, you burn both ends and hole punch both sides so you don't have to fight or try and figure out which one you're looking for. You can just clip it on there and, and change it out real quick. Nice. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Well, so James, what uh, what are some of the things you know that I don't know? It's it, it, David could help you out because you become yeah. a guide. I, think, I guess what I'm I think the here. general knowledge is it's just always well. I mean, I don't want to ask the man for his trades of the yeah, secret. Yeah, any like advice for him? Yeah, like I, I, I wouldn't say just me personally, right? But like, mm -hmm. as as someone that's that wants a guide. Or I mean, it could be anyone, right? That that because you've put in so many years of experience into to make a full career of what you've been doing. Mm -hmm. What would you? What would be your one advice to someone getting into that? You know, getting into guiding. Um, I don't know. I mean, details for sure. I mean that, but that's for anybody. For right. anybody, just you know, you're gonna the more you pay attention to details, the more fish you're gonna catch. Um. I mean, that's on the fish catching part, maybe on the client part. It seems like you end up, <clears throat> over the years, end up with clients that match your personality. Right. You know, I mean, because there's some guides that are, they're just BSers, you know. But then, then their clients are more into wanting to listen to the stories yeah. and catch it or whatever. And, and really, I think <clears throat> majority of the guides out there, everybody catches fish, you know. Right. You can't go on the, <clears throat> go online and say, hey. I want to go with a guide on the, you know, Columbia River, and you'll there'll be like fifty people recommending fifty different other guides, right. you know, and, and they're probably all going to catch. You're going to catch just as many fish with any one of them, you know. Yeah. You're going to catch the same, you know. Everybody's pretty good, you know, but you just got to find a. The clients have to find a guide that they like, I guess. That you want to make a memory, really. Yeah. I mean, that's I what mean, you're paying right, for, right? right? My clients, um, you know, I'm like 80, 90 percent repeat, and most of them have fished with me 20 plus years, yeah. at least 20 years, and they're friends. You yeah. Know? I mean, you go have a beer after, I, after we're done I go fishing. to their house. They oh, come to yeah. my house. You know, they spend the night at my house or we, yeah. yeah. I mean, they, you know, birthday parties. All, I mean, yeah. we're friends, you know. Yeah. We, you know, and it, I mean, some of them literally I've had, you know, where they, they're we're into their third generation now, you know. Right. You, you know that. Yeah. You might be grandpa Dave. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Speaking of generations, we have yeah. right here. There's my oldest grandson, <clears throat> trout fishing down there on Cake Mares Lake in Tillamook during COVID. <laughs> <laughs> we he came and stayed with us. I had him and then my nephew came and stayed with us. We did a bunch of trout fishing because they closed down all the stinking boat ramps on the on the county boat ramps. They closed down because of COVID. They didn't want people to catch COVID. So um, anyway, we were out there trolling around with my drift boat electric motor and the little mag lips and catching all kinds of rainbows. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, that's just another. Another, another good day of salmon fishing. Yeah. Salmon <laughs> right there. Day, yeah. <laughs> Holy smokes. I mean, I don't even think I've seen a day like that. <laughs> Maybe a couple times for 
Yeah. Yeah, I like those guys. You know, Sean on the right, he's fished with me for 20 years or so. Is that the Sean I know? or Probably. If, maybe. I don't know. Insurance? Yeah. 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 Remember we didn't we fish Did you fish on the club? Oh yeah, yeah on that tournament. That. Yeah. <laughs> That's we right. Did, I think we think we did well on that, didn't we? We did real well. <laughs> <laughs> Another fifty fish day here. Yeah, we only caught like twelve that day. <laughs> oh yeah, only twelve. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's a ladies' trip. My wife, mm-hmm. wife's on the left. Um and, uh, Is that so, coho fishing? Yeah, those were ocean coho out of Garibaldi. So uh, I do like four or five different ladies trips, all ladies. Um, nice. And, uh, you know, they get my wife will go along in a deckhand or whatever, or, or, you know, host it. I saw something about like like that buoy 10, they did a like a ladies tournament. They do have that too. Yeah. Somebody else does that. Yeah. But, you know, I, I wrote a. STS article called You Fish Like a Girl. Right. Yes. And after that, I tried to put together these ladies trips. Ladies trips. That's awesome. Yeah. It's that's uh, funny. it's pretty fun. I, you know, <laughs> women are better fishermen than men. So we have a comment from, oh, it went away. Went away, Tony. It was Dave something. Oh, here we go. John. John asks, so when is the. Dave Johnson, David Johnson, guide trip giveaway, <laughs> laugh out loud. <laughs> not too many of those. There's not probably too many of those. Because I'd be asking. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Usually I'll donate, I do, like the fundraisers for either kids or uh, some of the, like the Tillamook Estuary Partnership. Mm-hmm. You know, I'll donate to them for their fundraiser fish fish projects. Yeah. Oh, we're going back pictures there. So are you are you still like full time sturgeon? Are you doing any sturgeon trips? I do some or? catch. I do some catch and release for sturgeon. Um, the last two years I've done the last day that it was open in Astoria, but you know it's ODFW always gives you the opportunity to fish, right. not necessarily when it's good fishing. Yeah, you know. <clears throat> so like that Astoria fishery. It's early. The fish aren't really there yet, you know. Yeah. So they give you those three days a week, kind of similar to what you got up in the gorge. Um, but the fish aren't really in, you know. Right. So I've I've done the last day that was open for keepers the last couple of years, but most of the sturgeon I go for is more later May or later June or in July. Right. And then you know it's incredible. It's you nonstop. Know, it, it's such an unused, unutilized fishery. Yeah. There's usually zero to two trailers in a parking lot and you're going to go out there and catch dozens of fish and big fish some big ones yeah See, i went i went last year a couple <clears throat> times on when it was open and it, it was like what you're saying it was we were there and there was i would say there was you know 20 30 boats and maybe we saw one keeper you know out of all those boats yeah or you know even some got any action mm-hmm. so I, I could see that yeah and then, like, Steelhead, you're doing Steelhead full-time, like, yeah, pretty I, booked up? I'm pretty booked up. I think I, I probably got, like, maybe eight days to fill um, for the rest of the winter, um, unless they cancel Christmas Island, and then I'm going to have two weeks more, because I, I set aside two weeks. I usually spend a week in Hawaii and a week yeah. on Christmas Island, In that's going to be in March. And then full-blown springers, yeah. I mean... Obviously. Yep. Yeah, I'll be, I'm pretty, uh, I'm fishing really heavy usually from mid-March um, until July. Awesome. And then picks start right back up in August again. I will say, if you want to catch fish for springers, <laughs> David Johnson. That's well, sure. let me, uh, oh, you got some more pictures up there, Tony? Mm-hmm. Yeah, just yeah some, only, just you know, steelhead. 50 yeah. fish days and 12 fish days here. <laughs> Where's this at? That was at the coast. Oh. That was at the coast. That's a chrome bright one. Yeah, yeah. nice. You even got some belly to it. Mm-hmm. Well, awesome. Well, so David, um, let's uh Is there any more comments? Roll through the comments? I don't think so. Or you could ask them. So, let me ask you one last question. So, 
Trolling Tillamook Bay, mm -hmm. any advice, any tricks, any tips, or... Oh, here we go. Stay out of the seaweed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Fish the softer tides are better because there's less seaweed. Okay. <clears throat> Fish in the ocean as much as you can because there's less seaweed. <laughs> and keep it close to the bottom. No seaweed, keep it close to the bottom. It's so funny that you say that. I went and fished it this, this year, and I was like, how are you getting, to, like, it's just, you even get, like, close to the rocks, you know? Yeah. And it's just seaweed galore. And yeah. then I'm, like, complaining. You go to Oregon City, and you're like, oh, there's some algae in there. <laughs> and then you go out there, it's like, everyone, yeah. everyone's rods of seaweed. Yeah. It, it, dude, is it, is it easier to go upstream more, or just still kind of... I think you'll get less seaweed going with the current right. than holding against it, letting it pile up. Pile up. But usually that kind of seaweed's kind of flowing through. So if you can, um, you know, figure out where it's at, right. you know, like, you know, fish at the jetty before it gets out to the jetty you right. know, on the outgoing tide. And then once you're into the weeds, go back up in the bay and get a, you know, you got to kind of figure out the pattern of where the stuff's flowing. Right. But if you can get in the ocean, then you can get out of the weeds. So it turned into like, it was funny cause we were, we were fishing it and then it was like, okay, we're done with the weeds. We're going crabbing. And luckily like crabbing was really good, but <laughs> yeah. And you know, also check, you know, reel Tides, up a lot. Uh, yeah. No, reel or up, reel clean up. the weeds, you know I mean? And sometimes it's, Reel up this one, and as soon as that goes down, reel up this one, this one, and rotate. And as soon as you're back to that other one, you're... You're weeded out. Yeah. <clears throat> Tony's been with me like that. Clean the weeds, T. <laughs> Tony was the only one that caught oh, fish because he was the only one that was cleaning, cleaning his, his stuff weeds. off. <laughs> and he'd catch them when he'd, like, let out and go, oh, there's one. <laughs> I offered you to give my fish to one of the guys. I know. And you didn't. <laughs> And then he got mad at me. <laughs> he did. The guy was asleep. The guy was asleep, but Tony offered it. You're like, no. Oh, that's funny. So we have another so, question. Yeah, do you prefer bait casters or spinning reels? You're probably going to say spinning reels because you don't know. Spinning reels, and it's not It's not because the spinning reel is easier. It's because the spinning reel is more efficient because I can open the bale and fish it with an open bale right. and feed that line out much more efficient than you can feed it out of a level wind. Drift fishing, I like a level wind because it's kind of the feel, you know. It's a, you can back it off it, if you want to. Right, right. But with, with this bobbers, uh, spinning reel all the way. Another one, uh, Bobby asks, I prefer a center pin. What's your thoughts on center pin? Uh, I don't know. They're too much like a fly reel, so I haven't used them. <laughs> I like them. I, 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 oh, dude. I, the guys that, you know, I've got friends that use them and they, they love them. I just never tried one. Let's hear a story, Nick, on your center pin. Well, I mean, not much to say. They're just kind of, they're, it takes longer to reel in. Right. But fighting the fish is a blast. You can hold your float back and set your shot patterns just perfect depending on the conditions. And, you know, and they're, they're a challenge. Let's Do you think they're way. more effective or less effective? Or just uh, different? Casting yeah. in general. I, mean, I would yeah. say typically a center pin fisherman is going to be a good fisherman, so they're just going to be effective. And yeah. plus, okay. you, you, uh, when you hold your float back a bit, it pushes everything forward in front of the float, and you can really drive it down a pool, and it, it works pretty well. Okay. But it takes a long time to reel back in sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and then you're setting your own drag. I mean, mm -hmm. right, you're... You yeah, pretty, school and pretty much. When it wants so, to run, yeah, you it depends run. on the on the reel, I suppose. But yeah, there'll be a clicker or what have you. I, I haven't fished them. I mean, because usually, I mean, I a lot of times I only go fishing for steelhead nowadays. Mm -hmm. Three or four. Once it's full into the season, I'm yeah. either guiding or I'm sleeping in. Right. You know, on a week, I, I don't fish weekends, so I'm either sleeping out on the yeah. weekend or I'm guiding during the week, and I maybe only go steelhead fishing three or four times, right. and so. I'm just like everybody else, and I want to. You want to catch? I want to catch yeah, as many exactly. as I can. So, or you know, so I'm not gonna. I haven't play, been, play around with the center. So I haven't been playing around. Yeah, yeah. they're not real popular in this area. Well, they're gaining a little bit of popularity. It's a little like you know, Midwest. It's huge. Oh yeah. yeah, for sure. And out here too, it's starting to gain in popular. 
So we're definitely going to have some shows on center pin fishing for sure. And you guys can laugh at me while I uh, I can't wait to you, see the video. Show you my skills, but we'll, we'll probably take somebody with us who knows what they're doing. Do the uh, center pin work better in the lower flows of the Midwest? Is that why or? Uh, you know, because it's a little more finesse. That's what I would. Too. That's I think, what I, would I think, think a lot of it goes to uh, tradition. It's part of it, but um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's flow. You know, they were, were flow. So I, I'm sure you remember when we were up in BC, everybody's using. Even back then, they were using center pin. Yeah, um, a little bit larger style, but mm -hmm. it was really popular. <clears throat> like I could see what you're saying. Like in a faster flow, it'd be not as effective. Is that what you're saying? Well, it depends on how you're fishing them. You can hold, you know, you can fish them at any weight, speed. Right? Depends right. on how much weight, you know, you can just change your, your system. Mm. So, okay. uh, just a different game, basically. <laughs> and fun, cool tackle to buy. <laughs> yeah, <he's, laughs> yeah, it looks expensive. That's all I've seen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I've looked into it and I'm like, uh, man, that's, whew, that's a money. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's a lot of fun. So, well, what do you guys think? Got some more uh, more questions you want to talk about? Um, yeah, is there anything you want to talk about, Dan? I don't know. Well, you kind of talked about the. Um, I mean, I'm I'm always for talking about fish politics or fish biology or whatever. You know, I mean, I love to sit around and talk. All <laughs> so I, I have something. So. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, Grandpa, if you're watching, Grandpa <laughs> Frank. But so we were we were at Christmas. We were sitting down and talking about you know nutrients in the in the water mm -hmm. and then you know with all these fisheries you know underfeeding them or i don't know i mean i'm not a biologist and i know that i'm not no genius so I'm, what this is i just kind of you know hear from what everyone says but mm -hmm. is do you think some of our ri like rivers that have good nutrients when they let them out younger or underfed or whatever or to you know that size or whatever do you think certain rivers thrive off that, that do better because there's more nutrients in the water for natural food before they go out to the ocean? I don't think so. I, I think that nutrients in the water is more beneficial to the wild fish, you right. know, when they're frying, when they're hatching out and, and growing up. Right. Uh, by the time that they're smolt sized and they're letting them go from the hatchery, you know, they're spending a shorter, you know, small piece of their lifetime in the river. Right. So they're not really gaining any weight in the river. They're going out to the ocean. So, and that's so you need the nutrients in the ocean for those fish. Right. And that but, means the weather patterns, the upwelling, not, not right. El Nino. But you know? but I think what he was getting at, uh, at anyway, was the, you know, some of the upper watersheds and some of the streams that at one point maybe had big re returns of salmon, steelhead, what have you, that were, mm -hmm. you know, dying in the upper watersheds, creating those nutrients for the right, right. And that's road, wild fish, what have you. Yeah. So probably yeah. some of that. And yeah, honestly, some of the hatchery programs probably helped at certain points over the years with all of that, you know, depending. Of course, yeah. that's very arguable. And, and they do dump a lot of their fish, you know, it's right. called, it's called that's stream, that's stream too. enhancement. And that. Yeah, I see a lot of pictures they of They take their carcasses mm -hmm. up in dump them in the headwaters to try and spur that on you know that that's one thing what alaska has going for it <clears throat> is all those fish coming in and dying and spawning <clears throat> the way they uh manage alaska they they manage kill everything up to the escapement that they need right <laughs> and uh you know maybe they need you know so say they get five million sockeye salmon back to a river right. and they say oh well we just need a million for escapement go ahead and gill that four million <clears throat> what if you need five million spawning and dying to fertilize the river to get five million back but or if you, more but if you keep taking off that yeah. nutrient load you're going to get less i i mean <clears throat> we might be seeing some of that uh, maybe not so much for the sockeye because obviously they're having record runs of sockeye in alaska but that's how they manage it, yeah. For what, and some of the reason they're get, probably getting the record runs on, in Alaska on the sockeye too is is the water's a little bit warmer and it's more beneficial for them when they're out there feeding in the ocean. Right, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So we have a question by Bobby. What kind of line do you guys prefer? Let, let's stick with just monofilament or braid or fluorocarbon, maybe like for your rigs. 
Maybe he's talking about for, I would imagine, like Steelhead. We were talking about. Like yeah, braided to mono. Yeah. I uh, I like braid, you know, I like braid on the spinning reel. And then if I do, oh, like, wait. 30 or 40 braid. And then, like, like for spinners or twitching jigs or something like that, then I'll put a little bumper on there. And I'll usually I'll use, like, a 20-pound fluorocarbon bumper. Um Maybe in real low water, I'll switch out and not use braid. I'll run the bobber set up also on a top shot, and I'll use fluorocarbon for that. Um, for a leader, I'll usually use Maxima, you know, ultra green, but then I'll, and true. or I'll use fluorocarbon. And the, the times I use fluorocarbon, because fluorocarbon sinks and monofilament doesn't. So if I'm wanting to get down better, I'm going to use fluorocarbon. And so, mainly when I use fluorocarbon, it's not because it's invisible, which it is, but I usually use it for the application of trying to get the sink and not to getting it down, getting it down, not necessarily to hide it from the fish. If that makes sense. Yeah, that makes total sense. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, with braid, I mean, how nice is it to be able to visibly see in the boat where everyone's at? Yeah, that's and the non-stretch of the braid, so you can really connect. Quicker. Oh yeah. So we have another one from Cody Bloom. How much does hatchery release numbers affect rivers for catching? That's pretty big. Well, yeah. If they don't put any in there, we don't catch any. Well, yeah. Well, then the wild fish won't come back. What yeah. are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, then the wild fish <laughs> won't come back. Yeah, you want to talk about them. I have full of Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I really, think, I really think that most of our rivers are at their um, maximum capacity for wild fish. I mean, we can see. I mean... We could name off between you and me ten or twelve rivers that we used to fish that had hatchery fish, don't anymore, and they don't have any. The wild fish didn't rebound. They they probably have the same amount of wild fish they have now than they did fifty years ago. Right, and there are so many different cases where it's different, you mm-hmm. know, and it's it's hard to say. But yeah, for example, the Upper Clackamas River doesn't have any more. Hatcheries, hatcheries, wild steelhead oh, in the oh, yeah. river since they took out Past the, dam. the right. summer hatchery, and the reason they took them out was for the wild winter steelhead. So it was just I'm a not theory, really, really sure how that, <laughs> how that works. <laughs> right, yeah, that was, and that was just a theory. But right. people will argue endlessly on the genetics and uh, and things like that. Right, right, yeah. So cross contaminating. Uh, I mean, yeah, the more. You know, this, the, the shame is, the, the, or the, the sad thing is, there's only a handful of rivers that are stocked really well. So that's, they've become a zoo. You know, I mean, that's that's where everybody goes to fish. So uh, if we had a few more, you know. Yeah, so, so basically if, every you river, put, if you put more hatchery fish in, you'll get at you'll least get a, a bigger percentage return. Yeah. back. But it can cause... Other problems like right now, I do believe they're increasing the amount of uh, hatchery chinook smolts in the Columbia and some of the other systems up in Washington. I mean, that's kind of the word and bite some substantial numbers, and, and that's to help feed the orcas and what have you. Yeah, so um, anyway, there are things happening, right? Well, and a lot of those increases of those chinook on the Columbia are done by the tribes too, Colville mm-hmm. tribe and stuff like that, right? Right, but then on the other hand, I was you know, you, you can look at it from a lot of different sides, and a lot of people are convinced that the, you know, I don't know, hatchery fish are bad. I'd like to see the early returning hatchery winter steelhead, mm-hmm. and then let the wild later run, you know, kind of. Well, that's the way it used to be. That's how yeah, I kind of like, <laughs> 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 run back to <laughs> Yeah. I mean, that's what I like. I'm, I really miss a December, January fisheries. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's a better. Uh, for the public, it's better mm-hmm. because they've got that Christmas time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. yeah. Thanksgiving it's to New Year's. tradition, really, yeah. for a lot of people. Mm-hmm. When I've noticed, like, I mean, you guys have plenty of years, but, like, the t- like the first one I was getting into is, like, we could fish it for so long, like, when it started, and then we'd connect, like, the, you know, the later run fish from, like, the early to the later, and then... You're almost doing fishing every day, and then it would, and then the summers would come in, but everyone would kind of go, "Oh, it's springer season," and then you were still getting a really good summer run. Yeah, I mean, you were fishing from de- December all the way to you know March, April. Yeah, yeah, the Clackamas was it was winter steelhead from November to winters went November through April, and the summers went March to 
November. Yeah. 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 You're around. Yeah, it's too bad about yeah, Eagle yeah. Creek. That That's, that upper Clackamas. Uh Bob Tolman told me one time, he said, you know, they used to have more fish on tags, tagged from the upper Clackamas than the Deschutes River. Holy cow. Uh, you they know, did there it, for a few years. Yeah. yeah. It, was, it was that good. It was good. It was that many fish, and you could drive along and pull out on a pullout, and get out and stand on the guardrail and, and see if there was any fish to tail out and hike down there and fish for them and have somebody sitting up on the road and spot them for you and tell you where to cast. And, and you could see them hit. And, um, and yeah. it, it lasted like – it was probably – Basically June by the time they got up June or Fourth of July when they got to that upper part, um, but then that lasted all the way till now. Yeah. Hopefully we get back. Do you think it will get back to that point? Um, I don't think there's any law against not putting the fish in there. It's just about changing policy. ODFW changing their policy. Yeah, but I gotta say honestly, I mean the fishing. If you go to where there's fish is probably better now because of the techniques. Yeah, exactly. It's actually like, like substantially right. better. Yeah. The tackle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It'd make a lot of sense. Yeah, for sure. So um, so what else have we got on this list here, David? Oh, what do you got? We've got a whole list we here. Did. we got a whole life. Uh, you know, one thing that's terrible about getting old is I can't see. You probably can't either. Like, let's hear the story about working at Larry's. I don't have to wear those glasses anymore. <laughs> yet. Let's hear the story about working at Larry's. Because mm -hmm. I was, the, the guy that I was fishing with yesterday, mm -hmm. he Larry. was talking about, you know, going into Larry's and buying tackle. And that was the spot. And there was two, there was two Larry's, right? The one in Gresham. Mm -hmm. And then the one in Oregon City, was that correct? They had um, a little one up there in Woodland. And then after a while, they opened one um, on the west side, too. And by then, that's when the, the business started going down. They kind of expanded a little bit too much and, uh, you know, whatever. And, and then they ended up... Uh, I don't know if they bankrupt or sold out or whatever. It became Northwest Outfitters, I think. And then then those guys closed after like a year, and then it became the Fisherman's Bot. And Fisherman's right. was around just as long. It was just in North Portland, so it wasn't in this Clackamas area, yeah. you know. And it, it seems like uh, this area sure has produced a lot of guides and fish, oh, yeah. fishermen, you know. And, and sure. majority of them probably have worked at Larry's. <laughs> Or fishermen's. Yeah. Or fishermen's, yeah. yeah. Really true. I mean, even today's age, like, I mean, I mean, that's a lot of the kids, like, yeah. even me, I mean, I grew up in Gladstone. Mm -hmm. So it was like, fishermen's was right. right there. Right. But it's funny to think that. You yeah. Know, that's so true that, and we had a really good fishery mm -hmm. in our backyard. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I started working for Larry's uh, right out of uh, high school and worked through college. Were you getting and, discounts on tackle? Dude, and, it was so cool that you could go in and uh, whatever you bought, yeah. you know, you took up the register and the gal would write it on a slip and put it in the till and they would take it off your paycheck. <laughs> I get one time I had a paycheck zero. <laughs> zero, zero, it's all tackle. Uh, yeah. Or rods. Yeah, rods and tackle. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. So and then seeing all the new and in fancy stuff that would come out, right? right. I mean, you and could touch the, it and play with it. And. Yep. And, and that's where I started guiding. You know, I started guiding and, uh, you know, would talk to people and say, oh, here's my card, you know. And so a few of my customers have. Have stayed from Larry. stayed from that way wow. back then, yeah. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Did you ever go to Larry's Snack? Never. Never <laughs> went there. You and Tony? I was pretty young, but I remember. I think no, they, they got into the skis too. They had a ski department. Yeah, I learned to ski there too because you can take yeah. uh, the rentals for free <laughs> if you're an employee. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, now I went there constantly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they probably yeah, live there. They had the yeah. travel department on the one side. Yep. Of the building. Mm -hmm. I, I ended up working at the uh, um, Gresham store because I went to Mount Hood Community College. Right. So. so it's convenient. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, I went there and. We probably got another question. Fish before school, <laughs> during school, right? School. Yeah, you. That is. Uh, I don't think I've ever met anybody, and I've met a lot of fishermen that was 
as serious about it as you were at that really? age. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean, you that's all you thought about. Hmm. Period. From what I could tell. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. Do you still have the spark, like, from your first trip to now? Do you still have that, like... For a permit? Yeah. Trivia. Yeah. <laughs> Christmas Island. For Christmas Island. Oh. The bonefish too out there? Or yeah. Oh, yeah. Out? We yeah. can bonefish. Yeah, that's a Mo- most guys go there for bonefish. Right. They it's... fly fish for them and stuff like that, you know. But, you know, yeah, I, I go to fish for those. Yeah, trivoli. trivoli are unlandable to yeah. a lot of people that are, especially if anybody fly fishing. Like right. have a hard time with them. <laughs> oh, man, they do. Yeah, 12, pound, or 12 weight rods. And yeah, you hear the stories of somebody hooking one while they're fishing for bonefish and their fly yeah. line's just gone and rips across the yeah. coral and breaks off. Yep. Yeah. It's cool. You know, you usually, um, you're paired up with a guide. There's two, two clients and a guide, you know, mm-hmm. so we're paired up with a guide. The guide will carry our rods for us. Uh, so we'll, we'll take a GT rod and a bonefish rod with us. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, while we're, whatever we see, we, you know, fish for as, as we're going along. Is there a lot of spot and stock? It is. If you want, you can do anything you want. You can tri- you can fish in the flats and it's got the, biggest flats in the world you know out there um for the bonefish and they're really good at spotting fish too yeah you know really? they're like 12 o'clock you know 30 are you feet. are you waiting out or are you in a boat uh mostly for the bonefish you're waiting if you're gonna fish for those um trevally and trevally kind of inhabit all the different habitats right. so they're in the surf you catch them trolling you catch them in canals you catch them on the flats or on the edge of the flats Sometimes we use live bait. What's the best? What's the best hat? I don't know. I mean, because we just use different things in different spots. Right. So, they're, you know, sometimes they, we use just cut bait or live bait, um, but it is fun casting a popper for them, too. Oh, they just and, and, and you just you're ripping those things as hard as you can <laughs> and really, you know, and then bam. <laughs> You've seen on that Blue Planet TV show, Yeah. there's a thing where they're, they're catching the birds yeah that's the giant trevally really yeah oh that's and them so they're like smart enough they on that show they talk about how they're smart enough to calculate the angle and how, the fast, speed, how fast to jump out and catch those birds that's insane yeah so how big what's the biggest one you've caught or how big did they get um we uh drake's wife caught one that was like a hundred pounds um wow 50 60 pounders are the ones i've caught some yeah, big, big ones. Yeah, yeah. Ones. It, and you'll catch little ones mm-hmm. um, on like a steelhead rod, mm-hmm. and they just smoke you. <laughs> right, I think those are the ones that get up on the flats. On the flats, yeah. The, uh, the bonefish. Yeah, right? and there's bluefin, there's bluefin trevally. There, there's different color, different kinds too. Yeah. So they're tougher than even albacore. Like, oh yeah, way tougher. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because even albacore, man, I'm like, you go out and you're like, okay. You're not expecting her. You're like jigging her, live baiting, and then it just hammers. Mm-hmm. You know, like, holy it's smokes! Dumb. You know, this yeah. sounds way more. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, Tony, Tony, what do you think? You got what, any what questions? Is, yeah. Do I have any questions that we didn't that we didn't cover? Gosh, I I don't think so. I mean. I, you know, I fished with Dave. We bank fished. Remember that for Clackamas? I think we were jig fishing. Remember, remember that? That was a long That time. must have been know. way That was a long man. ass, yeah. We didn't catch him. That's probably <laughs> Grandpa Frank was with you. I don't remember it. Yeah. Yeah. But no, I, I fished with you on the Willamette. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Tillamook Bay. Yeah, it's been yeah a while, the but... Columbia. Wait, yeah. most you guys did the did the, the Derby yeah. a couple times. Yeah, with, yeah. yeah. they would draw for the Derby we all the time. Derby. Yeah. yeah, that yeah. was the boat. Like I would always, I, I remember the, when I was the Buoy Ten Challenge. Yeah, the Buoy Ten it. Challenge. We mm-hmm. went it twice, in twice a year, something like that. Twice in two years, yeah. Yeah, two years. Yeah. 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 It's back. Good time. Yeah, it's all going downhill since then. I was just trying to go on that trip. Yeah. <laughs> like, Tony, is there an open seat now? That's for you fall. <laughs> oh, I know. There's something interesting that, that you started doing was running a super long rod way up off of the bow. I remember that. Yeah. That kind of different. Yeah, and, yeah. For, for doing the, yeah. the Columbia like that, instead of using, instead of me fishing a rod off the back, yeah. which mm-hmm. everybody else gets hit first. You right. know, those fish are aggressive enough. Usually mine never gets a bite off the stern of the boat. Yeah. And then I'm having to run the motor, reel that wind in to get out of the way, and that the fish, 
I started just running a rod off the bow with a heavy lead. And in that way, I don't have to mess with reeling it in. You know, when we get a fish on, or just it stayed out there. And a lot of times you get your get no doubles way. out of that too. Yeah, so that works. So Dan asks, talk about the steelhead run on the Eagle Creek. Um, Eagle Creek used to get a run of like 3,000, 2,500, 3,000 winter steelhead. And usually it was kind of, it was now, you know, December, January. And, uh, man, we, I asked you about the one o'clock rock that was right there below the deadline, below the falls, Yeah, you know, cause you had to get there at one o'clock you know? to get there It was because it was everyone great. would be crowded was, right there. Yeah. It was way popular. And, uh, yeah, it was just a great fishery. Um, for whatever reason, they decided that that rudder fish wasn't quality enough or, you know, yeah. it wasn't. Mm -hmm. So now they do Clackamas River stock in there. And ever since they switched it over, it's literally had runs like to the hatchery. They get, they're getting like seven to 15 a year back yeah. instead of 33,000, you know, 3,500. You know, something it, I learned on that creek was like, you know, it's great to fish it when the water's high. Green, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, Fish the edges, right? But the water will drop, and you think they're gone. But they're they hiding be right behind little <laughs> rocks. Little so, rocks are even in the riffles. It's a little yeah. bubbly on it, and, and but it's still, I mean, it's still mm -hmm. hard to find them. Sometimes. And that's where that float light line and mm -hmm. small would, would work really well in there. But, but yeah, we fished it all the time from the, the federal hatchery all mm -hmm. the way down to the upper falls and then the lower falls. And then I was... Uh, Spent a lot of time in the lower end of it, sometimes even floating it all the way down into the Clackamas. And mm. I mean, I've learned, learned that thing inside out. And, you know, it still has wild fish in it. Mm -hmm. and, and apparently it's getting planted with the Clackamas stock. So I'm I may or may not have caught one a couple weeks ago. In there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. Well, so. and it, it provided a big fishery for the Clackamas, too. You know, yeah, we exactly. caught. And that's, so and that's what I was like. December, January. Yeah, Barton the Carver, right. stretch like that. And then a lot of times it would run low and they slow down so mm -hmm. you know the that area yeah. could be really good for the mile below the creek right yeah it. well and all the way around barton and all that area yeah. was all really good uh, eagle creek also used to have a lot of springers uh and i believe it was like it, it's got like some of the best quality water mm -hmm. of any hatchery well. and uh but they they switched Switch putting right. the springers in there too, and right. I think maybe their excuse, mm -hmm. if I remember right, was because too many people snagged them in the creek or something. But when was this? When were they planting those? Uh, they, they, they probably quit in the early years. 90s. And years. I, I think they are planting now. They went back to planting some springers right. in there. So, so in a future issue of Salmon Trout Steelheader Magazine, we're definitely going to have uh, an updated article explaining where all the fish are planted. In the Clackamas River system, along with uh, numerous other places, but that's going to be coming, and we might even go up and interview the hatchery manager. And yeah, because the coho are doing. Involved. I mean, the coho running that is actually pretty decent. I mean, it is, and they plant it with a number, a lot of fish, and a, a big portion of the Columbia fish um, above Bonneville, I think, are coming out of that hatchery at this point too. Really, so, mm -hmm. I think they used the Eagle Creek stock. I mean. I know they used Eagle Creek stock coho, and I don't know if it was that Eagle Creek at Bonneville or Eagle or Creek one. here. Yeah. But that's mm -hmm. what, like, the tribes used to put into the Yakima River and maybe some of the other, like, Idaho rivers. And now they're getting big runs of coho up there, which is pretty interesting that these fish from way down here are going hundreds of miles now yeah yeah they adapted it's, right so so again a lot of you know people i don't even know so it'd be nice to just kind of go find out yeah I'd be curious to see i mean it'd be nice if they planted still in there like they used to and maybe they're you know i think they have some acclimation ponds down by bonnie lure down by the mouth right. and maybe that's why they're not getting as many up high because mm -hmm. they're stopping where they're well, releasing. Well, that's what I was wondering. That's mm -hmm. that's a possibility. Yeah, that was my question, because you guys would know more, right? Is is how effective, I mean, some people might have a question out here, is like, how effective is those acclimation ponds to our systems? Real effective. Yeah. They they really do return kind of back where they were. Where they were let out? And yeah. 
Yeah, even where they're yeah acclimated. Yeah, right. he, and yeah, definitely if they're acclimated, they return there in really good numbers. But even you know if they release them at boat ramps, they kind of they'll still come around come around mm-hmm. there. Now, you know some some places they scatter plant them like they do on the Wilson, and that spreads out the fishery and improves the fishery and gives right. a lot of area for people to fish, and it kind of slows the fish down. Other rivers they switched. You know, and they switched because they don't want those hatchery fish to, inter- to intertwine with it. Right. Um, and uh, so, like, North, and they might have switched back, but like North Fork to Halem, they went from scatter planting them to just letting them go from the hatchery. And then, boom, the, and North Fork Alsi and the North Fork Nahalem, they do that. And the fish go straight back to the hatchery as soon as there's a high water. Yeah. And they just blast right through. And um, it was. A lot more fish were caught when they spread them out. Right. And then also, I, I don't know if they're getting back to recycling fish. You know, and a lot of it just boils down to the biologist in the area, what he wants. So it's kind of... We're at his mercy. We're at their mercy. Yeah, know? we're their mercy. For people that work for us. Right. <laughs> but our, they you know, do what they want, you know, right. or whatever. Because they used to recycle fish on a lot of these rivers, the Clackamas. Yeah, the Clackamas they you know, the they'd get to the dam, yeah, the they'd put them in a truck, take them down, the cowlets. Let them out. Uh, let them out and let them go through again. Now, generally, they do race back really quick. Like, they, they do recycle them on the North Fork and Halem. But they race right back to the hatchery because that's where they came from. Right. Um, but at least they give anglers a little bit of a chance to right. catch them again. Right. You know, but there's just a, a real fear of some people that these wild hatchery fish are going to spawn in the wild. And I mean, so be it. Yeah. I mean, well, our pockets. <laughs> Time I mean, will tell as they collect uh, we'll, collect more we'll and more see. data. More yeah. data. Yeah, we'd be exactly. better off if they. Or, I mean, if if somehow they were required to prove, like before they shut down a river, you know, mm-hmm. say they're going to put, uh, oh, we're going to take away the hatchery fish on this river because they're going to spawn the wild fish. Well, right. Before you do that, let's do a genetic test on those wild fish and see if they're different fish actually. And if they're genetically similar, there's no need to remove the hatchery fish. Come on, Nick. Let's hear a song. With a 10-foot pole. <laughs> but anyway, yes, yeah, so I like to catch fish and lots of fish. That's where I'm going with that one. Right. <laughs> yeah, so. Anyway, well, I don't know. You probably need to get going here soon and... Probably be snowing on my way home now. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't know if it's raining. Well, it was well, raining a little bit on the way. Well, here. listen, well, thanks for coming yeah. up. This yeah. has been a lot of fun. We're going to have to do this I again. Appreciate we're going to have to go do yeah, it Thanks for coming. Room. Nice meeting you. Yeah, nice and, meeting you. Uh, oh, everybody see enjoyed room. this, mm-hmm. and yeah. this is the first time I've ever done this personally. So this yeah, is kind Dick of made an appearance. I have no right idea on. what I'm doing, but I. <laughs> we plan to do a lot more of this, James. Yeah. That was fun. Yeah, hopefully. Thank I mean, you, Dave. It's so good to see you too. I know. Jeez, but but we fished. We fished in April. Mm-hmm. This last April. That's the first time we've fished together for like five years, I think. Yeah, probably I know. something like yeah, that. That's, yeah, I think geez. the last couple times before that was doing that tournament. Right. So, and that would have been yeah, a while back. And, yeah, but before yeah, that, jeez, that, that was, was probably around 50, 2015. Mm-hmm. Probably, I'm gonna yeah. guess. I haven't seen him. Yeah, I haven't seen him in years. Yeah. So it's good to see him. Yeah. 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 So, uh, well, don't we're not, off the road. Yeah. <laughs> so we're not going to do it tonight, but I guess in the future we're going to be having all kinds of giveaways and uh, drawings and what, what else? Yeah. All kinds of fun stuff. Hopefully we do some more giveaways and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Oh, we have one last question, huh? Joseph, Joseph Ooh, asks. Just- Thanks for your advocacy and one of the nicest guides. You took it away. Thanks. <laughs> Not one of the nicest yeah. guides out there. Yeah, yeah. I agree. I, <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, Dave is truly one of the nicest guides I mean, I've I'll, ever I'll, met. I'll <laughs> say it. It's, it's no question about even, that. Even, you know, you've I've maybe met you on the river, right? We fished. Yeah, I don't remember. Ever but you never, you, you know, like not even intertwining with me, with mm-hmm. them. But it's like seeing you out there. Being kind on the river and, and it, you know, if someone's in, needs help, you'll help them. And it's, it's cool to see that, you know. Thanks. Coming from a guide, honestly. 
Thanks. And growing up and being kind of a yeah. like, there's a lot of fishing. I got kids right that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. Nick's right. out. Easy. 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 Just hit that end button. Hey, so yeah, I just want to say thanks, Dave. Yeah, yeah. thanks for having me, Tony. Thank you coming out here. And, yeah. and and you know what? Dave, you know, he's actually kind of a shy guy. So if he doesn't talk to you out on the river, it's not because he's ignoring you. It's just because you just get a little bit on the shy yeah. side. I am too, believe it or not, even though I'm doing all this kind of stuff. But uh, he's a great guy. If you ever get the chance to go fishing with him, I highly recommend it. Book him up, David. <laughs> Book him up. Thanks. Yeah. So thanks for coming. All right. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thanks, thanks for having me. Thanks for showing up, James. Anchor man. No T. Yeah. All right. So hit the end button. All, All right. right. See you guys later. Later. Oh, I'm looking at the wrong spot. See ya. <laughs>